All right. So before we get started today, um, this session will be recorded. It's currently recording now. So um, if you know anyone that might be interested in any of the information afterwards, it will be available on our website. I will also send out a direct email um, to all the participants with the link to that once it's uploaded. And uh, while we do, while we air the lecture, um, if you'll just make sure to have your mics uh, muted at the end, we will have a Q&A session and you're more than welcome to uh, just unmute and ask a question live or you can use our chat feature. You can also use the chat feature during the lecture itself and kind of keep track of questions as you go if you'd like. Uh, so that is your option as well. And um, I'm going to let Josh do a quick introduction into why we chose this topic, what we're what we're talking about, and then we'll go ahead and air the lecture. It's about 26 minutes. And then, like I said, we'll do a, a conclusion and a Q&A at the end. Yeah, so we're really excited about this topic. Um, this is this is a really fun one. Santa Claus is is a major part of our holiday celebrations and he is a, a very American thing. And um, what we wanted to do with this is, is track some key moments and some key time periods in the evolution of Santa as we know him today. This is by no means the origin of Santa or anything like that. And then the reality is, if you've ever seen any or read any article, the true origin of Santa, there are hundreds of origins of Santa. He's an amalgam. The traditions surrounding him are ridiculously complicated. I mean, we could probably do a two hour lecture on my personal family traditions with Santa alone. And I think each of us could probably do that for our families as well. So what we wanted to do was just showcase um, where a lot of the core things that are that exist today come from and highlight some of the major milestones. Uh, the first of which, of course, that we're gonna start with is the poem, Night Before Christmas. Formal, uh, formal title is A Visit from St. Nicholas. And um, it is, if there's one foundational document to Santa Claus, that's what it is. So without any further ado from me, take it away, Josh. We'll now go live to pre-recorded, Josh. You'll just <laughs> give me one second and I will share my screen and we will get. A Visit from St. Nicholas by Anonymous. Troy Sentinel, New York, December 23rd, 1823. "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there rose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below, when what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and whistled and shouted, and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, Dunder and Blixem, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly, when they met an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the top of the house the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed in all fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot and a bundle of toys flung on his back, and he looked just like a peddler opening his sack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, and his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, 
and the beard of his chin was white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a reef. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed out loud when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink in his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to work, and filled all the stockings, and turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside his nose, he gave a nod, and up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the dawn of a thistle. But I heard him explain, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. We hope you enjoyed that Christmas classic. I'm here in the winter foyer of the W.H. Stark House, right in front of the fireplace, which is the perfect place to talk about this Christmas classic. A visit from St. Nicholas, or as it's almost universally known, The Night Before Christmas, is one of those great American classics. It not only gives us the basic template for the character of Santa Claus, it also firmly roots new traditions that are uniquely American in the Santa Claus myth. Now, the poem itself was first published anonymously, which is very important, uh, because without an author, it was basically able just to sort of exist and become myth and legend very quickly. And that was, I think, always its original intent, to be this kind of great American myth. And while it does pull heavily from Dutch tradition, uh, from the old New York Dutch community, there's a lot of things in there that aren't Dutch. And perhaps the most important thing the poem does is center all the activities and events on the night before Christmas. As the first line, as the name that we all call it by, suggests. By creating the Santa Claus character as this jovial, non-threatening, gift-giver figure that happens before Christmas Day, Santa does not compete with the star of Christmas morning, which is, of course, baby Jesus. So this allows a saint figure to be celebrated and to be a part of a largely Protestant community in the United States. And it really lets people run with the whole tradition. Now, it was written at a time when people are trying to make American myth, and it came from a very concentrated group of writers and authors in New York State that were focusing on largely Dutch, some German traditions as well, um, to try and create this sense of ancientness to American society, bringing these traditions and rooting them firmly in the U.S. Um, the author who eventually was given credit and took credit is uh, Clement Clark Moore. Now, he took credit about 20 years after it was written, uh, and he's generally accepted, as, was always accepted as the author. Recently, it's been challenged by some scholars that it was actually um, Henry Livingston Jr., who was a distant relation on his wife's side, who was the actual author. To be honest, we probably will never really know whether it was written collaboratively, whether both of them had variations of the same story, similar idea, and to be honest, it doesn't really matter. The great thing about The Night Before Christmas is it really transcends all of the, those things that becomes a legend that people could adapt and change. And there have been some changes over the time. The poem that I read earlier probably sounds a little bit different, not quite as smooth, not quite as refined. Um, keep in mind that this is really more of a spoken word art than it is a written form, and that countless generations over the last uh, 200 years have read their own versions. And so the poem has become more refined. It's always adaptable. The cadence and the words change slightly depending on your region and locale. But the core story has remained remarkably intact. A few things most notably have changed, like uh, the Dutch versions of Dunder and Blixem were replaced by the maybe more poetic German Donner and Blitzen. Those minor uh, changes aside, the core story has stayed the same. 
and it really forms the basis for this jolly, jovial character that really sparks the imagination of illustrators, and they really run with this basic description. And while there's a ton of stuff that we recognize in the poem, a huge amount of the, uh, of the image of Santa was created by successive artists who added their own flair and added things to the Santa myth that we now think is joined together. For instance, there's no mention of Christmas tree. Also, while most images of Santa today show him full size, most uh, you know, the, the story talks about him in miniature with tiny reindeer and as a small little man. So to talk more about this, Hannah's going to go into probably the most important of these early illustrators. So that artist was Thomas Nast. And before we talk about his illustrations themselves, we need to take a quick look at who he was and the publication that produced his work. So Harper's Weekly was a periodical illustrated magazine and it focused primarily on literary content in its earliest days. It originally started uh, its weekly publications in 1857. That was following a pretty successful model by Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, which started in 1855. And Leslie's had a reputation for following current events and being a little bit more sensational. Harper's Weekly was trying to avoid uh, that characterization and so they really tried to maybe sprinkle in some current events, but were really much more focused on literary content. And they tried to remain fairly neutral towards the lead up to the Civil War, but ultimately um, de developed a pretty pro-Union uh, Republican stance. And so Thomas Nast actually began illustrating for Leslie's newspaper first, and then he would s consult with Harper's Weekly and offer a few images for them to produce, and then ultimately joined their team full time. So Thomas Nast was born in Germany and he came over to the United States with his family when he was six. He's known as the father of the American cartoon. And he rose to prominence during the Civil War for his battle scenes and his depictions were considered both complex and compassionate. So a little bit different than what a lot of other artists were producing. He's ultimately best known for his editorial cartoons. He's very political. Um, he is very pro-union, liberal, progressive Republican, and so much so, and he has so much influence, particularly during presidential elections, that he receives threats and he, for the safety of his family ultimately moves them from New York to New Jersey um, while he's illustrating. And so unsurprisingly, because of Nast's own background, he introduces Santa in a very political way for the first time. So on January 3rd, 1863, these two images appear in Harper's Weekly. And this first is Santa Claus in the middle of a Union camp. Uh, Nast depicts this jolly Christmas character uh, in the middle of the Union Army. He's giving out presents. Uh, most of them are necessities such as socks. You see that the soldier to the far left of the frame is unboxing a thick wool sock. And he's also wearing, uh, instead of the red suit that we now commonly associate him with, he is wearing the star-spangled jacket and striped pants. So very pro-Union, very pro-America. And from his hand, is dangling a jumping jack doll that represents uh, President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. And so it's a very polarizing image if you're looking at this uh, with any Southern sympathy or if you are uh, in the Confederate States. Um, I was curious after I saw this if Santa had a little bit of trouble taking off in the South because of this initial representation. And I did find several articles that referenced uh, children being told that Santa's not coming, the Yankees shot him, or no, Santa's a Yankee and you know, we're not celebrating him this Christmas. Ultimately, it does not take long for Santa to catch on throughout the United States. But this is certainly a very, um, very pro-Union Santa in this first image. And then we see in the next image, we have a very 
very busy setting in this picture. And so in your two main vignettes, you see a separated family. And to the left, you have uh, two children tucked into bed with a wife kneeling in prayer at her window. And on the flip side of that, on the side to the right, you see a soldier in his Union camp and he's sitting by a campfire and he's gazing into this small photo album and you can see images of his wife and child. And so this is, NAST is really emphasizing the separation of the American family in this, uh, in this picture. You've also got the sobering realities of the war that you see at the very bottom of the frame. You've got a naval battle um, in the right hand, bottom right hand corner, and a land battle going on in the left hand. And then the, in the center, below those two main vignettes, you see a graveyard. And so just a, a very sobering reminder of what is going on in the nation during this period. But at the top, you see something very interesting. And you've got a large Christmas Eve banner and you see Santa, and he is visiting both the Union Army camp and the family at home. And you see his reindeer, you see him shimmying down the chimney um, in the vignette to the left, to the top left. And then on the right, he is distributing presents uh, from his sleigh out to the soldiers. And so in his initial depictions, Nass seems to be focused less on what exactly Santa looks like and more on what Santa can do. And in this case, Santa is able to be a connecting figure to the separate family in this time of war. And he's able to visit people in their homes and at the army camps. So over his years of illustration, Thomas Nast ultimately produces around 30 images of Santa Claus. And we're gonna pop a few of those up on the screen here because they're, they're really rather charming. They include many German elements from his own background and upbringing. Santa also has a little bit of a German look, partly because of Thomas Nast's style of drawing. And that was, he used kind of his self-portrait idea to sketch, and he would often model his own features in his figures. He would also sketch based upon the layout of his local town. So in a lot of his images, you can actually match up the town he was living in at the time with whatever's ultimately depicted in the illustration. And so perhaps his most famous Santa Claus and what has been dubbed Santa's official portrait is the 1881 portrait of Santa Claus. And this appeared in a full page spread in color. And we see Santa in his very bright red coat. One of the things that Nast did was he changed Santa's coat from tan to red over the years. We see very large rosy cheeks, a very rotund belly. He is draped in toys, he's smoking a pipe, and he has greenery and holly in his cap. And unlike this potentially small elf-like figure from the night before Christmas, Thomas Nast really makes Santa a full-bodied man. You see that in his original uh, introduction of Santa to the Union troops, all the way through full-bodied and a little bit larger than life. And so this really becomes a fairly codified image of Santa Claus that a lot of people, this is widely produced even, even today. And so from here we're going to look at, now that we've got this solidified, more solidified image of Santa, how he continues to develop and how he becomes mass produced as we get towards the latter part of the 19th century. So we have the basic story and now we know where Santa's looks came from. But there's also this whole other story about how Santa got everywhere and how he became so popular. Um, not surprisingly, it really starts in the New York area where the poem was originally written. Uh, Washington Irving actually uh, started the St. Nicholas Society of New York in um, 1835. And Irving, you know, the great American author, one of the most important in American history, uh, probably influenced the poem originally quite a lot with his own work in Dutch tradition. But they really promote this, this idea of Santa as a unifying figure. And what's interesting about that, while it starts off as a regional New York, New York thing, local communities really grab onto it. And this is the most important part of the Santa story, is that you have local ads, local advertisers, all putting their own spin and taking this basic idea of the jolly, rotund, happy gift giver that is Santa 
and make him universal throughout the country. And they do this oftentimes by localizing him, making him a, a special local custom, you know, incorporating him into the air traditions. And he's used to tremendous effect to sell stuff. That's a huge element of this. And not only does he sell stuff in ads, the image of Santa and Santa physically in, the ter in, in uh, terms of Santa impersonators or Santas play a huge role in spreading this legend. One of the first ways this became very popular was to illustrate copies of the Night Before Christmas poem. They became extremely popular in the late Victorian period. We actually have three of them in the W.H. Starkhouse collection. The first of which is from 1888. And what's interesting is, while you can definitely see influences from Mast, it still retains some uniqueness in the image. It still retains a little bit of individuality. Um, the colors that Santa's wearing are a little bit different, more um, natural oranges and, and uh, browns. Also, the way he's presented, he's not quite as jolly, he's not quite as round, um, and it's just a, a, a more classic view. He's covered in fur. Perhaps the most notable thing that he doesn't have, he doesn't have the Santa hat. He has the traditional wool-crowned winter hat that was often worn by many people in Nordic countries and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. What happens though over time, and you can see this in the illustrations, is a more uniform and a more typical version of Santa begins to emerge. And some of that is influenced by other factors and other Christmas gift-giving uh, gift figures. Um, the next uh, Santa from our collection, he's technically a Santa, he's Father Christmas from 1890. This is a beautiful card that was sent to Letcher probably around the time he was three or four. And it's this wonderful illustration, it's very European, it's actually a, a British figure that was printed in Germany. And it shows the very dignified, tall, slender Father Christmas. Father Christmas from the English tradition is one of the dozens of characters that morph into the American Santa. Uh, there's some very big differences between him and Cinder Claus, the Dutch version. Um, and actually, this card was a relatively recent development that the Father Christmas was a gift giver focused on kids. The traditional Father Christmas in the English uh, custom was really more about adult celebrations and really more of a Bacchus-like character. Probably the most famous version of him is the Ghost of Christmas Present in uh, Charles Dickens' uh, uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, you know, this big, covered in green, happy, lively party figure. But what happened over the course of the Victor uh, Victorian period was he became more of a dignified old man and more of a gift giver. And while the British probably would never want to admit this, that's probably a lot of American and German influence on a British tradition. Now, when you morph the dignified Father Christmas even more, you can see in this wonderful ad we have from um, 1908, you really see you know, Americans having fun with it. And this is a wonderful local ad from the Orange Leader, and it really just showcases how important localization is to the Santa myth. Because you have this cool ad that's basically celebrating Orange and it's advertising Orange as a modern up-and-coming city. Keep in mind that this is just a few years after cars were common and they really still aren't. The Model P has really just begun its production. And so Santa racing down Main Street, beard flying in the hair, you know, hat, cat flying in the wind. It's really very fun, very cool. And these kinds of targeted local ads are extremely important. Virtually every community and almost every industry, from cars, soda, candy, washing machines, everything has some version of Santa doing something. And that's really important because it localizes Santa and groups him in everyone's tradition. It also lets him be whatever he needs to be in whatever community. Uh, our neighbors right across the river, there's lots of versions of Santa, you know, driving alligators and, you know, uh, speaking in a Cajun dialect. So 
Santa's very morphable and very changeable, and that was all done by largely local authors and probably more, most importantly, local ads. And so this tradition of ads is extremely important. And you can see it all sort of coalescing towards a more unified image. By 1918, this is our uh, 1918 version of the uh, Night Before Christmas. This is more or less the Santa that we recognize today. You can see that he's really codified into the that classic Santa red with the white skirt, and white trim, white hat, and of course he has the classic Santa's cap. Which is interesting because in no culture does a hat like this really exist. I've done a lot of research on this. My personal theory is that the Santa hat really comes as much as anything from those early illustrations of the night before Christmas with Papa in his cap. And so our Santa hat, our winter hats, are actually a derivation of sleeping caps. So it's really interesting how much, you know, full circle this all plays, that you have a sleeping cap in a poem that's illustrated a lot, and then it just becomes synonymous as a Santa hat. So that basic image that we're seeing there in 1918 really is the codification of that masked Santa, big, jolly, that bright red. And from that point to today, Santa's basic image is largely unchanged. And part of that is because in the 20s, that basic image is plastered everywhere through major national campaign uh, advertisements, specifically, most famously, but not exclusively, by Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola, in the 1920s, be uh, begins this very long relationship with Santa that they still have today. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing whether Coca-Cola evolved to be Santa Red or Santa evolved to be Coca-Cola Red. I mean, they're very heavily linked. And what the Coca-Cola Corporation do does is they really bring this story full circle. They, a very southern company, go back uh, to the Nast image and say, that's what Santa is. And they take that basic red, fat, apple-cheeked, jolly Santa and plaster him everywhere. And they have the money and the um, marketing outreach to really make big, beautiful posters, very Norman Rockwell style, all over the country. And these images become extremely popular. They're beautiful scenes that people love and adore, and they're very clever, very creative, and they're also like uh, uh, often customized to local areas. So people have their own images of Santa. And this really is the key to the story. Santa becomes personal to everyone. Another big part of this, and me as a genetic Santa, I come from a long line of people who have taken on the, uh, the red suit, and we normally have the rotund belly and the beard, so don't have to put a, that doesn't have to be fake. Um, that's another huge part of this, is you have the image of Santa, you have the story of Santa, you have Santa all over in the media, and then you have physical Santas. The Santa impersonators and the Santas that are all over shopping malls and uh, stores, sometimes at churches, but again, this is more of a secular thing where you see Santa in places of retail. Um, and these are people who are very dedicated to this, they take this very seriously, and they, for generations, have done a very good job spreading Christmas cheer. I have to throw a shout out to my Uncle Art, who, uh, this is an image of him with my uh, cousin. Uh, he was Santa for many years. He portrayed Santa at the local post office that he worked at for close to 30 years. And um, he took it so seriously, in fact, this is the last time that he was ever in his Santa suit, uh, that when he was no longer physically able to have kids safe on his lap, he said, I don't want to risk dropping so a kid. It is something that people have taken very seriously and have personalized. And I think that's the real secret of Santa, is he isn't an abstract figure. Every one of us know him personally. And that's the real magic of the night before Christmas, of the illustrations, of the ads, of the, of the Santas, is they make him personal to us. And he is still very much a living, vital part of our culture. Right. Thank you, everyone. I apologize to those of you that were having some sound issues. Um, 
I will try to, the next time we record, I will try to make sure I embed an even higher res microphone in that. We do have, when we record in the house, we have a lot of feedback that comes in from the air handlers that are in, that are uh, in all of the spaces. So I will work on that next time. So thank you for your patience on that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna let Josh do a quick conclusion that wraps up with some of the uh, 2020 Santas that we have seen, some of the imagery that's been used. Uh, so go right ahead, Josh. Yeah, so um, Hannah and I, before we get into the questions, we kinda wanna bring this uh, to the current discussion because Santa is a living feature. He is, he is very much active. Another thing about Santa is Santa really tends to shine in times of crisis and in times of, of trauma. Um, you know, there's some wonderful illustrations of Santa in World War I, World War II, um, you know, Santa during um, the Great Depression, there's some wonderful images. And so I think it's natural that during uh, 2020, which has been a very difficult year, uh, there's been some really interesting ways that Santa has come to the rescue. Uh, so a couple of the trends that we've noticed um, is of course, mask Santas. Uh, there's a lot of Santas out there, uh, t-shirts and ornaments that you can get with Santa wearing a mask. And so Santa, as ever, the, the wise, trusted figure, you know, you gotta wear a mask, so does Santa. You know, um, another thing that's been interesting is there's been a lot of Santas of color, a uh, black Santa in particular. There's been um, a lot more, uh, uh, seems to be a lot more il uh, illustrations of black Santas. Um, and general representation just, of exactly yeah. um and i think it's fair to point out that you know we talked about the um, diversity there's a very strong tradition of santa claus in the black community and black santa is not a new thing he's been around for a very long time so i think visibility there again a 2020 theme um another one that's kind of interesting is there's been a resurgence in the jesus and uh, santa high-fiving and the uh you know, Jesus and Santa being shown together as sort of, um, you know, unity and we're all together. Uh, I think that's that's another 2020 thing. And another big trend is obviously we're not having nearly the uh, the big gatherings in malls. There aren't long lines of children to sit in Santa's lap. But just like everyone else, Santa's gone to Zoom. And there's a lot of the Santa impersonators and the Santas are um, offering um, uh, Zoom sessions. Yeah. And they often have like really elaborate scenes, kind of like we've set up here with Christmas and everything. And and what that allows is for kids to still have the one-on-one -on -one interaction with Santa, um, you know, and, and uh, so. It also makes it seem like, you know, if, if Santa's working from home too and is at the North Pole, I think it can really create a, a setting for children to kind of maybe get a sneak peek. I've seen several signs, just even yard signs that advertise, you know, Santa by Zoom appointment and then a number to call. So um, there's there's definitely Zoom Santa's by appointment is, is a new thing for this year. Yeah, and, so. I, and again, I think, you know, people wanting to maintain that, um, that connection and and have that that personal interaction, mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I think it it showcases that the holistic nature of how Santa's incorporated into our celebrations, visually by myth, and then you still have actual Santas. Mm -hmm. Well, we have quite a bit of time left, so we'd like to open it up for questions. Um, any that you have thought of during the lecture or that you are thinking of now, um, please feel free to either unmute and ask the question or uh, type those in to the uh, chat box. We would love to answer any questions and um, have further discussion if y'all are, are curious. Um, let me see here. And I do encourage you, if you haven't, if you were in the area and if you have not seen it yet, um, take a drive by the WH Stark House. Uh, we do have all of those images that you saw in the latter portion of the lecture. Those are printed on six by four uh, feet banners and those are lining the fence line on the exterior of the house. They are lit up in the evenings um, along with the Christmas lights on the house and uh, different trees that are spot lit. And so um, that's, yeah. It's a nice drive in the in the evenings. 
Um, one thing too that I, I'd, I'd like to sort of um, re uh, reiterate from the talk is that the it's hard to overestimate how much of an amalgamation Santa is. And um, while there are obviously historical links to figures like uh, like Saint Nicholas and and others, um, the evolution of this and, and the way this transforms really is pretty incredible. Yeah, Josh, I was just wondering as I as you were going through the iterations of Santa. One of the, my childhood memories is the various Rankin Bass Christmas specials: Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Father Time. Uh, did you do any? They seem to characterize some of the. They seem to be a continuation of the um, traditional Santa. But did you do any research on that? Yeah. So um, we. I mean, the thing about this topic is it's just massive. And I said trying to do all the origins and all the things of Santa is insane. One of the things, though that is very consistent is Santa and his creation is outside of like typical literary uh, tradition. There isn't like a novel about Santa and all of our myths come from this one novel. And so poems and different theatrical productions, TV shows, I mean, one of the most important um, sources of Santa myth and one of the most important characters for us understanding Santa is the um, uh, the uh, original um, Miracle on 31st Street. And so, you know, that movie really did bring Santa, you know, make him much more complicated and make sort of the belief in him fashionable. And he, like, it really did change. It, it added a lot of layers to him. And so all the Christmas specials, all the different things, they each add something, um, you know, even the more contemporary movies, I'm thinking, you know, the Tim Allen movies, you know, the, the Santa Clauses from the 90s and things, they add different layers and different levels of depth. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of characters are added by these successive stories and things. Um, Rudolph, for instance, is probably the most famous one who okay. he's a complete invention that's just thrown in there, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I, I think he kind of fills a bit of a gap that was in the mythos because when you have Rudolph come up, you have the oddball. Because one of the things about Santa is he's he's kind of the ultimate orthodoxy, like he's everything, he's everywhere. And so for people who didn't feel like they fit, oh, I guess you have to be a good boy and good girl and be the perfect person for Santa. Well, no, Rudolph is the red-nosed reindeer that no one, no one likes. And then all of a sudden he's the hero. So I think that there are, um, each generation has added different parts to Santa and each generation has, has, has changed and tweaked different things. But to your point about the cartoons, one of the consistent things about it is the most influential things are these visual representations, are these stories that we tell. There isn't a codified, like, um, there, isn't, there isn't a single source. And so each time something gets added, it just happens organically. Right, like if you're talking about something like some of our Halloween traditions, like Dracula, and you have this specific mm -hmm. mythos that all these characters come from with Santa, the origins are all over the place. And actually, so a couple of our questions tie to um, the origin of Saint Nicholas. And yes. so we have a question um, from Anne, was Santa a creation independent of Saint Nicholas, or were there the early connections to the Turkish Turkish bishop, and could we talk a little bit about St. Nicholas? There are, um, but this is why this gets so convoluted. So Santa's connection, as we get him in America, from uh, the original Turkish figure, they come through other cultures, because obviously our culture wasn't around. So the Dutch version, which is probably the single most influential version of our Santa Claus, the Sinterklaas, that's where we get the Santa Claus from, he is a Dutch derivation that is heavily influenced by Nordic in, uh, um, influx of um, the, the, the St. Nicholas cult that developed. Um, and the reason being is that um, St. Nicholas, of all the early saints, he's one of the earliest saints, especially one that isn't associated with Christ or, or isn't in the Bible. He is one of the most important in part because he his shrine, the the worshipers of uh, the or the uh, the church that was associated with him, was very active in sending his relics out. 
And so to a lot of the second and third generation communities that were converted, so the communities that were converted in the fifth and sixth and seventh century, specifically in the, um, the Nordic communities, the only ancient saints that they had relics of were the, the relics from St. Nicholas that were given from um, the church that supported him. And so he became very associated with these, uh, those sort of, I don't want to say later converts, but you know, that, that second wave of the, the periphery of Europe. Uh, St. Nicholas is extremely important in uh, Russia. You know, he's one of the most important saints in the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, he's also the patron saint of virtually everything. Um, you know, he's the patron saint of sailors. He's the patron saint, he's the patron saint of a lot of things because, he, again, he's heavily, heavily adapted. And so our versions of Santa, there was a historic saint who was from, uh, he was a Greek in Anatolia, what is now Turkey. Um, our versions of him come through multiple layers. So we have versions of him that come from the Slavic and the Russian traditions. We have versions of him that come from the Nordic and Dutch traditions. We have versions of him that come from the, uh, the German traditions and the Italian traditions. So St. Nicholas comes to us in multiple different forms and there's different features of him that all follow through. The big unifying thing with St. Nicholas is that he is kind of there for people who don't have someone. That's probably the one sort of unifying thing uh, you know, he's the patron saint of, he's one of the patron saints of thieves. He's the patron saint of prostitutes. So he's, you know, and he's the patron saint of small children. So he, again, he's kind of patron saint of everyone. And I think that's kind of why he's so adaptable is he is, he's the character that can, that can become in that. But our Santa Claus is very, very far removed from the saint. And he's been filtered through many different things. Ironically, Chris Kringle, that name comes from an anglicized version of um, uh, Kinderchrist, which was uh, the invention that Martin Luther tried to create to get rid of Santa Claus. He wanted Martin Luther during the Reformation did not want us having saints involved in worship. So he created this idea of the Christ child, that a, a visage, a version of the Christ child was the gift giver. And so we Americans, of course, have gone full circle with this because we've taken a figure that was created specifically to eliminate Santa Claus and specifically to eliminate St. Nicholas from Christmas. And we've literally turned a derivation of his name into Santa Claus's actual name. <laughs> so it shows how all these things kind of funnel together. And so the simple answer is yes, St. Nicholas does influence our Santa Claus. The complicated answer is there's 1800 years of history and interpretation and dozens of cultures all meshing together. All right, yeah. Um, and then we have another question. Um, Trina is curious if there was ever a live Santa who made an appearance in orange when the Starks were living. Yeah, we, we do have, um, there are Santas all over the place. We have images of um of santas in downtown orange there were definitely santas around and I, I think that's a really important part is santa is used not just by commercial instances but also you know salvation army a lot of charities organizations have used santas and so you will see santas pretty ubiquitously everywhere um really famously during world war ii one of the most successful uh war bond drives all throughout the war were the christmas drives and they were largely led by Santa. And you have these, you'll have these images of in small communities. I haven't found one of Orange, but I'm sure it happened here, of you know, Santa riding on a Sherman tank and you know, raising money. Here, I want to gift our soldiers more of these. Help me give them more, more of these. And you know, so Santa's everywhere. There, there is not a community in the United States that you're not going to find Santa's. And certainly um, Santa was very much a part of. Christmas celebrations, all during the period the, the Starks were alive. Now, it does change, and I would say that the real heyday of Santa and Santa impersonators don't, doesn't really take off till the 20th century. You'll see them in the 19th century, but again, that imagery is more abstract. Really, it is in the 20s when everything really coalesces. And so from the 20s forward, most of the traditions that we have 
are in place. Before that time, they're a little bit more disparate and they're a little bit more less codified is probably a way to say it. And so um, you would have families that, that were of German descent probably doing more German things. You would have families that were of English descent probably doing more English things. Um, it isn't until the 20s that a really standalone American version starts just to take over. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we also have a question regarding if we have any letters from the house collection that make reference to Santa specifically. That one image is from a Christmas card, uh, the image of Father Christmas that we showed from 1890. That is of a card that we believe was sent to Letcher Stark when he was three or four. Um, but in terms of actual letters written about Santa, I am not aware of any. Although who knows what Eric might find in the archives yeah, at any time. I think it's telling. Um, we have three co illustrated copies of The Night Before Christmas. And um, they are, um, I think that the, the Merriam and WH's connection to Santa probably didn't really become strong until they were grandparents. Mm -hmm. And because a couple of our copies are, are, are newer uh, from, you know, the, uh, the, the 1918 one, things like that. So I have a feeling um, that they were really more uh, involved with the creating the myth for their grandkids. And that, that's a huge part of this too. And actually, I didn't mention this from, from the poem, but one of the other big things that's implicit in the poem is that the parents are an active part of it. You know, uh, it's, the poem is actually narrated by the father waking up and the father is telling presumably his children or presumably other people about his experience with Santa Claus. And I think that's a really important thing. We talked about how making it personal. It's also very family. You know, this is how important Santa Claus is to you probably depends on how big a deal your parents or grandparents made for you, how much effort they went to, what your family traditions were. And so it really does appear that, that Miriam uh, being the big book lover that she was, we have a lot more of Santa related things from the twenties and from the late teens which makes sense because that's when they were really gearing up to be grandkids. And that's also when she, beyond her own grandkids, that's really when, you know, that's the period when she established the um, Stark re uh, reading contest. That's the period when she was running a lot of Sunday schools. So Miriam really took on later in life, a very influential role in specifically kids and kids education and the Santa myths and all the different poems and all the things surrounding it, uh, we, um, you know, we also have a couple editions of um, Christmas Carol. I mean, those Christmas traditions, I think, would have been very prominent for Merriman and WH later in life. Uh, we know, for instance, that one of the things that they did is our grounds here at the house were the largest green space in downtown. There wasn't a large park downtown. And so they invited all the children from, from Orange to big games and, and big um, festivals on Christmas on their grounds because they had the largest gardens downtown. And so Christmas celebrations, I'd be fascinated to know, I have not found evidence, be fascinated to know if, I do not know if WH or Letcher portrayed Santa, it would not surprise me. Um, but what a great beard WH but what, would yes. have had for Santa. <laughs> and, and I think that's part of it too. One of the things that kind of is great about Santa is he's not that hard to achieve. If you can grow a good beard, and if you are a little bit fat, your time to shine. And there's a there's a lot of guys at, of a certain age that can go a great beard and have a little belly, and so you're just automatically a Santa. So I, I think that that's uh, that's another part of this. We do have a question um, from Miss Joey Black, who is asking: In the first postcard with Santa climbing in the chimney, it looks like he's wearing a burglar's mask. So I can actually speak to that. Um, that is. And you'll notice this in a lot of the 1870s, 1880s illustrations of Santa. People seem to really be trying to emphasize the wrinkles on the face. And so there are a lot of dark marks in that 1888 version that are surrounding his eyes that are supposed to be wrinkles. But it does, from a distance, kind of make it look like he's wearing some type of mask um, because of the lines. We also have it's um, a version of the Christmas Carol, I believe, actually. Mm -hmm. Or no, it's our other version of the night before Christmas. But we have Santa 
and he's got lots of lines on his face that are meant to look like wrinkles, but it kind of creates this, it's this kind of very distracting image, and we call him Zombie Santa um, amongst the staff because he kind of has this upturned nose, and that that really is what it makes it look like. So it's interesting. You see Santa continue to evolve in terms of imagery, but as printing methods become more advanced and developed, you do get cleaner, clearer images. Yeah. Um, and so Sarah actually asked, do you have any additional insight on the Orange Leader illustration and its context? Was there information about the artist? Um, she says, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Our 1908 Santa is our favorite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so the context for that, and, and, and as to artist, no, we does not appear mm -hmm. uh, to be anything, could not find one. no artist on it. Um, it was almost certainly, um, if not custom ordered, it was adapted for Orange, probably on, on a, a fairly generic publisher type thing. So for about five years, the Orange Leader, largely sponsored by local businesses, the, the Lechmore Lumber Company being a huge one, mm -hmm. did these massive, big, beautiful, full-colored, multi-page editions. And it's actually, these editions are actually where we have some of our best early photos of the house and some of the local communities. Um, and they were... 10, 15 pages, big color ads, and they were big celebratory things, talking about orange um, development, talking about all the big opportunities in orange, and really sort of celebratory of orange. And so we have, uh, Eric would know this for sure, I think we have four or five years of them. And um, they were, they must have been extremely expensive. Um, full color, you know, that big, beautiful Santa. And they're very much from that peak when orange was at its really sort of cultural and economic hegemon of the lumber industry, um, you know, right around that, that tens, teens era. And um, uh, for that one in particular, I think it was probably geared, I, I think it would be hard to say that there's not, you're not seeing a little bit of Francis Ann in that. Uh, if we presume that the orange leader biggest backer was the Lechmore Lumber Company, which very, very safe assumption. Uh, Francis Ann was a huge lover of cars and a real early adopter, and I can totally imagine Francis Ann being like, Santa doesn't use those old reindeer anymore. He <laughs> uses uh, he uses a car. And actually, it's funny, uh, Francis Ann actually owned reindeer at the time when that was printed. Uh, there were reindeer at the Roslyn Ranch in Colorado, um, and Francis Ann is uh, Letcher Stark's mother, Miriam Stark's, uh, uh, Letcher Stark's grandmother, Miriam Stark's mother, um, and she actually eventually those um, reindeer were eventually donated to the Denver, um, the Denver Zoo. But yeah, so she, Frances Ann's another one of these people who would have been all about traditions. She was very much the grandmother of Orange. And so I, I'd love, this is a topic that we can do endless research. I'd love to do more about the local Orange celebrations. Actually, Eric, who we credit for this image because when we told him that we were looking for a Santa representation from kind of each decade of the house, oh, yeah. we had several already. And Eric went to the archives and found this fabulous illustration. Um, Eric has said that the artist is Charles Frey and he is a newspaper illustrator from Chicago. See, so. Eric knows more about this than I do. <laughs> No, and we, um, we really appreciate all of Eric's help in helping us um, find that image and get it scanned and get it uh, blown up. It's definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely a fun one. Um, and uh, Miss Black, in response to your comment, I will happily send out an image of Zombie Santa with our wrap up for this yes. program. Uh, so I will pass that along when I send everyone the live uh, link. And now we know that we have um, an excuse to have reindeer downtown yes, because of Francis Ann's connection. Of course, so yes. I think, yeah, I think we're off to a very good start for future Christmases. Um, if anyone else has any last uh, questions really quick, we have a couple more minutes. Um, but we thank you for joining us. Um, we thank you for your uh, wonderful feedback. Judy, thank you for your kind comments. Um, we've enjoyed researching this topic and uh, putting this together. It's, it's a really fun one. And again, this is, uh, we, we hope to do another um, Christmas lecture next year. And th there's limitless things we can research. Hopefully by then we'll maybe have some more information on some of the things that they did locally. Um, I think the biggest thing sort of to conclude is I think why Santa's so fun is he is a living expression of our current culture. 
And whenever you look back at the Santism history, you're seeing a really pure version of that time period's culture, their values, what their aspirations, because that, that's really what Santa is. Santa's, you know, while he's for the, you know, while he's, he, you know, while there is the whole coal thing and thing, actually, it's interesting, if you notice, there was no mention of the coal in, in, the, uh, in the poem. Santa's for everyone, naughty, nice. I mean, really, he's everyone. There, you know, there, there, there are sort of attempts to make him kind of a, a righteous figure, but honestly, he's kind of everyone. And I think you'll see him everywhere. And like I said, this year, I think he's played a, a really interesting role, like he always does, in helping reassure people and trying to, you know, um, make something that's very ex exceptional in a very difficult year more normal and seem more mm -hmm. uh, in line. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. We appreciate it. Uh, we've enjoyed exploring this with you, and I will send you uh, the link to this entire presentation uh, probably on Monday, and I'll send out some more fun Santa images just to go along with that. Um, so without further ado, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us.